welcome you to our nine o'clock worship service. Thank you for being with us. I hope on the way in you received a, a bulletin, one of the handouts, uh, not only our order of worship, but it's tons and tons of news and announcements inside you'll want to be aware of uh, activities today as well as on through the week. And uh, you definitely want to, uh, to leave with one of these today so you are in the loop on uh, how you can be active in the kingdom of God this week. If you have not filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we'll have some gentlemen come through in just a moment and pick those up. Uh, lots, of, lots of family happenings. Uh, and Charles will have more to say about uh, those matters uh, this hour. I should also mention Andy Lyons' class will not meet today, so uh, those of you who normally go there, um, feel free to check out another adult class. There are several, and those two are listed on the, on the handout this morning. So, If you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our worship. There is beyond the azure blue
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us uh, the opportunity to gather uh, together to sing songs of praise to your high holy name, to study your word, and to speak to you through prayer, dear Lord, and we thank you for hearing our prayers. Uh, dear Lord, we are mindful of many who are sick and those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you comfort them as only you can. Dear Lord, uh, as we gather around your table each week, remember the great sacrifice of your son and, uh, and the hope of salvation that that sacrifice gives us. We pray that you would forgive us of when we sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We serve a perfect God. Everything he does, everything he creates, everything about him is holy and righteous. And he, he created man, and that was his intent, but he gave us free will. Man has fallen subject to sin. We brought that upon ourselves. We brought that curse upon us. And God provided us the law. The law is perfect. It, the law is not the problem. It is we. We are the problem. We are weak, and we have brought, that, brought sin into our hearts, and the law has now become a curse to us. Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14 says, 
For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So even as we are imperfect, God is still perfect. His plan is perfect. And His perfect plan calls to redeem us through Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of sin that we brought on ourselves. And that's why we're here this morning, is to recognize the fact that He is perfect and He has redeemed us from the law and from our own sin. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful to have a Savior who loves us so much. We are so thankful that He perfectly followed you and followed your law and was sinless where we cannot be. We are so thankful that He was willing to sacrifice Himself for us, that His blood covers our sin, and that He has redeemed us from the curse of sin so that we may be seen as righteous in Your eyes. Father, as we take this bread this morning, we remember the flesh that Jesus put on as He came to this earth and all that means. We can't comprehend the full impact that that has. But we are thankful that he became like us so that he might save us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray together once again. Father, as we take this fruit of the vine, we are reminded of the blood of Christ that he gave willingly, that he spilled on that cross, and that covers us of our, covers our sins and allows us to be seen as sinless in your eyes. We are so thankful for that sacrifice, Lord, and we just pray that we would turn our minds and hearts back to that cross just now. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time we're mindful of everything you bless us with. We know that we're, we get far more than we deserve, Father, and we give you thanks for that. At this time we're thankful for the opportunity to give back a portion of these blessings to you, Father, and we just pray that these funds will be used to further your kingdom. For our son we pray. Amen.
right before preaching, but there are some things we need to share real quick. Uh, so if you are planning to come Saturday morning to the Sweetheart Banquet, how many of you are planning on coming to that? Okay, a few of you are. Let's call Miss Donna, let her know we're trying to make prep preparation for food. Uh, this is going to be a great banquet. We're looking forward to spending some time with you and serving you and just having a good time. And so if you're planning to attend Please let Miss Donna know in the office uh, again so we can let those who are preparing the meal uh, to be aware uh, about how much to prepare for. And uh, if you just come last minute, we're going to feed you uh, as well. So uh, we want you to know we want you here, and we're excited about that. One other thing quickly. Uh, I know that we've been talking about going across the street and, and helping in our community and one of the many ways that we do that is by helping those who are in need, right? The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, which I have that, that, passed, that very passage in my sermon this morning. But uh, do good to all men, Paul would say, but especially those who are of the household of faith. We do have a request in our community. Uh, I know Jason Brown is working with a family who is in need of a, a stove. And so if you have a used stove that you would like to uh, donate uh, to the church and allow us to get that in the right place. Just make sure it is working, please. Uh, I think the one that we had in the uh, storage unit uh, across the street did not work. And so uh, just make sure it's working. But we want to we wanna do good, as, as much good as we can in this community. Amen? Amen? And let the light of Jesus shine through uh, all that we say and all that we do. So there's a couple of announcements for you. Let's continue to talk about loving your neighbor. Last week... We talked about who our neighbor is, so we don't have to guess who is it that we're serving. You know, it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter how much money they make. It doesn't matter uh, what part of the city they live in. If they are here in this area, they are our neighbor. And that was one of the things that Jesus was talking about when he uh, was asked the question, well, who then is my neighbor? And uh, again, I just think Jesus is beautiful in many ways, but Certainly getting uh, this lawyer, this religious lawyer, to answer that question with an answer that he would have never given to me was quite amazing. And I, I love that story, and I love the way that it all ends. And so we talked about that last week. So who is our neighbor? It's everyone who is in our community. And again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul wants us to do good to people right here across the street. Across the street from the church, you know, across the street from your home, right here in our community. Uh, again, that's one of the things that when we talked about across the aisle, 
It's one thing to love people in this, in this room, right? Or to love people that may not be here but are a part of our spiritual family. That's one thing. And expected, mind you. We're to love one another, and as a result, it, it, it uh, certainly tells our community, hey, we love one another, and, and it presents the picture of a beautiful family. Not a perfect family. I love what Daniel said. God's perfect. Jesus, our Savior, is perfect. His law is perfect. His plan is perfect. We are not. But one thing we can do as imperfect people is love one another. And that has an impact on the community in which we live. So when we talk about going across the street, what that does is it takes us outside of this building into the streets of our community and it allows us to do as much good as we can to as many as we can as often as we can. Matthew chapter 22, you might remember we've shared this thought, but uh, a Pharisee, when he had heard that Jesus had silenced uh, the Sadducees, uh, they gathered together, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him this question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment, right? You, you, you narrow it down. Give us the one commandment in all the law that we need to hang our hats on. And you remember Jesus said in verse 37 of that text, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then you might remember Jesus also says in verse 39, And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Certainly, that's what Jesus communicates on these two principles, these two commandments. Hang all the law and the prophets, everything summed up in one, in one short thought. Love God and love people. And, and that's really our mission when we think about loving your neighbor and going across the street is that we are to do the best that we can. Now, I want you to think about how we can accomplish those two thoughts uh, that Jesus shared in Matthew 22 in, in one event, one activity. Think about this. What, what is the best way to show, to express, to demonstrate that we love God and that we love the people that God created? What's the best way to do that? Well, you might remember in Matthew chapter 28, most of us are familiar with Matthew 28. Uh, we're familiar with what we call the Great Commission. We're in a uh, a, a co-worker relationship with Jesus, our Savior. We're in this commission together to, to do all that we can to help others. Well, what's the greatest good? We're to do good to all men. What's the greatest good that we can do for all men? Well, isn't it uh, sharing the message of Jesus? Verse 19, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Isn't the best way to show that I love God? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, right? If I love God, then I'm going to obey this command. I'm going to take the message of Jesus uh, everywhere I go. I, I love a book that Sister Anita shared with me. Um, it, it's by the same author, for example, that we've been thinking about who, who wrote the book 30 uh, Days to Live, if you had 30 days to one month to live. Um, they, they wrote another book entitled Be the Message. This was a big push a couple of years ago. It, it kind of went across the religious landscape that we need to be the message, right? In other words, we need to live in such a way that shows that we love God and that we love people. And, and really, that's what Jesus is saying. I want you to go out and I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just uh, pause for a moment, okay? Um, and, and I want us to think about verse 18 in connection with what we say when we baptize. So I'm going to stand on a little soapbox for a moment, you know. Let me, let, me, let me say that when we baptize someone into Christ, there's no like special formula that's dependent based on our words. You, you understand what I'm saying? So for example, when we baptize someone, we baptize them in, in the name of Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, that, That's what we do. And we do that based on this passage. But it's not like a special formula. You, you notice verse 18 Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on our earth, okay? So this is really, when we say Father, Son, and Spirit, it's really an authority thing, okay? So the phrase, 
The, the Greek phrase, in the name of, literally means by the authority of. When we carry the message of Jesus to the world and we baptize them, we are doing this by the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It has the holy authority of God Almighty behind it when we immerse people into, into Christ. As a matter of fact, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you know, when you see that 3,000 people respond to Peter's preaching... We don't even see them saying in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He just says, baptize them in the name of Jesus. And again, which is okay because right here in our passage in verse 18, we're told that this is by the authority of Jesus Christ. God wants us to go out and be his message. But we're not perfect. We, we've already established that. But we're going to be as good as we can. And we want to help as many as we can. And when we're doing that, we're doing it all in the name of Jesus, hoping that at some point we can sit down with an open Bible and share Jesus. And when we do, you know what? God is honored and it shows that we love our neighbor. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. C.S. Lewis said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men to Christ to make them into little Christs, basically disciples. God became man for no other purpose. I want you to understand that the reason that God became a man in Christ was to save us from our sins. As a matter of fact, that's really the premise for the whole book of Hebrews, to show that Jesus did what he did as a man so that he could offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. This is the very purpose that Jesus, for, uh, for which Jesus came. Uh, again, I, I'll keep quoting this, but Luke 19, verse 10, in that story of Zacchaeus, Jesus shares his purpose. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Again, identifying our purpose. We want to be on purpose with what we're doing. And think about this. There are people who live right across the street from this church building. There are people who live right across the street from you and me. There are people who are living in this community that are facing eternity without Jesus Christ. How frightening is that? And you know what? God is depending on you and me to step up and love Him and love people and to take this message to them, the lost. Yes, they are lost without Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. And that's the thrust that we see in all the New Testament, isn't it? This thrust of going out, being the message, taking Jesus, helping others to obey Him, and to come in contact with His saving blood. The good thing is we've got good news, don't we? We've got good news in Jesus. How many of you are thankful for Jesus Christ? How many of you are thankful for, for His grace? And you know what? It's not for you only. It's for those people, yes, who live across from this building. It's for those who live across the street from you and me. And it's for everyone in this community. And ultimately, we will talk next week about how it's for everyone in the world. Well, why do you think that we spend time going to places like Honduras and Nicaragua? and other parts of the world taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's because people need Jesus. Now, what I want you to see for just a few moments is I want you to see that uh, there is a story in Acts 8. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open to Acts 8 for just a few moments. Very familiar story. I'm not going to really share anything that's earth-shattering here, something that you haven't heard before. I think sometimes reinforcing the simple, reminding us of what's important is, is certainly needed. Uh, Paul uh, Peter talked about reminding brethren uh, over and over of those things that are essential, and so I think we need to do the same. I don't think there's any difference, uh, even though there's a lot of time between us. I think the same thing is needed. But at the beginning of Acts 8, what's interesting is you have this mass uh, evangelistic effort. You, you, you've got this... Uh, revival, if you will, in Acts 8. I mean, tons of people are coming to Jesus, right? And, and as a result, you know who is preaching this unbelievable uh, revival? Is it Paul? Is it the great Peter? 
You know, is it, is it one of the brothers of Jesus, James or Jude? No, no, believe it or not, the guy that's actually doing this very thing in Acts chapter 8 is someone just like you and me. I mean, he was just a local table waiter, if you will. You might remember in Acts chapter 6 where in the church there happened to be a, a, a little bit of a disturbance. There was a little bit of, a, of disagreement. Justified or not, I'm not here to say one way or the other. But nonetheless, it was brought to the attention of the apostles that, wait a minute, we've got some women that are being overlooked when they're handing out food. And so we would like the needs of these women to be met as well. And so the apostles said, okay, we, we see this is an important thing and, and uh, we don't have time to do this uh, service uh, at this ministry. But we think it's important, and so we want to get some, get some individuals who meet some qualifications. There were three specific qualifications given in Acts 6 for the men that would serve these Grecian widows. And so there are some men that are chosen uh, that, uh, from among uh, the church to serve in this capacity. And, and you know one of the men that was chosen just simply to serve, to hand out food, to the widows in the church, and especially not overlooking these Grecian widows, one of the men, Philip, just a common table waiter at the time in the church, goes out and shares the gospel with many in Acts chapter 8, the beginning of Acts chapter 8. We see revival in Samaria. What's interesting about that is, I love Acts chapter 8 because it also shows us the importance of individual uh, Bible study, the importance of individual, uh, what, what we would call it is personal evangelism, meaning that it's personal between you and the individual that you're studying. And we get to see just this common guy, Philip. We get to see him personally study the gospel with someone else. And what a beautiful thought that we have in Acts chapter 8 when we look at this story. Allow me just to read the story quickly and then we'll take a few points home uh, with us this morning. Beginning in verse 25 of Acts chapter 8, we, we get to see this beautiful story of one-on-one -on -one Bible study. We get to see a, a beautiful story of personal evangelism. Now how many of you, and please don't, accept, don't, don't think I'm doing this to embarrass anyone, how many of you have been involved in personal evangelism, personal Bible study one-on-one -on -one with someone? How many of you have been involved with that? How many of you would like to be involved? You just simply, I, I don't know how to do that. Okay, maybe we need to have some classes where we open up and share more. But here's a great case study of how to go about doing that. Okay, beautiful story right here in Acts chapter 8. Uh, so when they had solemnly, uh, solemnly testified and spoke the word of the Lord, and they started back to Jerusalem, and were preaching the gospel to many uh, villages of the Samaritans. And behold, an angel of the Lord uh, spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, we've probably heard that in the news, haven't we? Uh, this is desert road. So he got up and he went. Uh, he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, fairly impressive individual. Uh, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit of the Lord uh, said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. And Philip, uh, Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Good question. Do you understand what you are reading? Okay. Uh, in verse 31, he said, well, how could I unless someone uh, guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture which, was, which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. I think that might have some impact on the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, why he took an interest in finding out who is this individual. I, maybe he was one who, uh, in his humiliation, his justice was taken, his, his judgment was taken away. 
Who will relate his generation? Another question. For his life is removed from the earth. Now, you might remember, who, who is, where is this passage found in Scripture? Yeah, it's found right in Isaiah chapter 53. This Ethiopian eunuch happened to be reading the, one of the most important prophecies about the coming Messiah. Now, mind you that at the time the eunuch is reading this, Jesus has already come, he's already lived, he's already died, and, and, and the eunuch has no clue about that. But he's about to learn, amen? Isn't he about to learn of Jesus and his great sacrifice for all of humanity? How beautiful of a story this is. Verse 34, then the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? I mean, I want to know, is he talking? Because I, I, think, I think trying to connect personally with the individual of Isaiah 53 was something that the eunuch wanted to do, right? He wanted to connect personally. I, I think that the, part of the, the uh, wording in Isaiah 53 struck a chord with this uh, eunuch. And so he's reading this passage. He's, he's a very religious individual, mind you. Does anyone by any chance know how far it is from uh, Ethiopia to Jerusalem? Long ways, right? <laughs> you know, it's a long ways. It's a long, a long piece, we might say. About 1,500 miles, and what's interesting is, as I look this up, some uh, records show that it's a 1,500-mile trip one way, and others even estimate it up to 3,000 depending on 3,000 miles depending on how you travel. Okay, it's a fair piece, we might say, right? One way. This guy traveled one way 1,500 miles to sit in the foyer. We might say at church in the temple because the old law, because he was a eunuch, would not allow him to enter into the temple. I want you to think about that. How many of you have that kind of faith and that kind of discipline and that kind of diligence to serve Jesus? To say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to travel 15, well, this guy didn't even know about Jesus at the time, but he was certainly doing this for God Almighty. I'm going to travel 1,500 miles one way just to show my faith to God Almighty. Would you call that great faith? Would you say that that's a faith that we need to embrace? But while this man has such tremendous faith, he doesn't have salvation because he does not have Jesus. Now what's interesting is he's about to learn about Jesus. He's about to give his life to Jesus. Just in a short study. You know, he already loves God. He doesn't, there, there's no need for having... Uh, uh, a study uh, of apologetics here to talk about God exists and that God created this world. That, that, that's not a study that needs to ha be had at this moment. The study that needs to be had at this moment, this guy's already demonstrated his faith in God. He just needs to know about the one that God sent to save him from his sins. And so as we continued to read, he began at that, script, that very scripture in verse 35 and preached unto him Jesus. In verse 36, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, what, what's interesting, and I want you to take note of this. I think this is extremely important. And I, I, I have a sermon, I will preach it sometime here, uh, talking about baptism, how it is the most concise and clear doctrine, the most consistent doctrine in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you don't have all of the things that we have about baptism in our 21st century culture. They simply did not exist in the New Testament. And so here is a case in point where we're told about Isaiah talking about Jesus coming several hundred years before Jesus came. We're told about this man reading that prophecy about Jesus' coming. And then Philip begins to tell him about the fact that Jesus is not coming. He has already come, and yes, he's coming back. Okay? Now, in the process of that Bible study, that one-on-one -on -one Bible study, all we're told is that the eunuch, as he's been taught about Jesus, says, I need to be baptized. And you know what? There's, there's no discussion at least in Acts 8, from what Luke records about teaching him about baptism. It is a natural response to Jesus Christ. You know the one thing that God did for you and me? The one thing that, that separates us from God is our sin, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. 
It's not that God can't save us. He can. The problem is our sin, our iniquities. We shared that verse last week. That's the problem. Your sin and mine. I mean, as Daniel shared at the Lord's table, we brought this on ourselves. That's a, it's our problem. And what God does is He remedies the problem. He sends Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel. Remember, we talked all about that during December. And God sends Jesus. And what's the one thing now between us and God, still our sin, what's the one thing that can cure it? Well, in one sense, baptism, but in another sense, no. Yeah, yeah, baptism, because that's how we come in contact with the blood of Jesus. But don't miss the point. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus' blood. You know, we, are, we have the opportunity of, of, of removing that cur- curse. Jesus can remove that curse. We can, through our obedience to Jesus Christ, have that curse removed for us. I guess it's not appropriate to say we can remove it. God removes it. But understand that the problem is the blood. We need the blood to cover us. The problem is our sin. The remedy is our blood. It's his blood. We need that to cover us. And the only way to get into that blood is, in, is through baptism. That is it. There's no other way biblically. Now, we can come up with whatever ways we want to talk about, but they're not biblical. This is the only means to come in contact with the blood of Jesus. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It is only through Jesus and his blood that we're able to enter through baptism to come in contact uh, with that saving blood and be saved from our sins. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. It's, it, it, it's all about Jesus. And it's all about His resurrection from the dead. Without Jesus and His resurrection, baptism would mean absolutely nothing. It would have no bearing on us at all. But because Jesus was raised from the dead and by His authority He says, this is what I want you to do, then you know what? We do it. And and this guy, this, this Ethiopian eunuch, was so excited about hearing about Jesus Christ that he couldn't wait any longer. Here's some water. We've been talking about this. Here's some water. What keeps me from being baptized? And what does uh, Philip say to him? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You you know, just this past week, we got to experience that here at Washington Street. I had the opportunity of baptizing Don Berger into Christ. Now, I I say I had the opportunity to do that. Do do you know why, outside of Jesus Christ and outside of his blood, do you know why Don did what he did? You know, he he told me, he said, said, I had this uh, experience uh, around Thanksgiving, went to a a funeral, and some uh, close friends were talking to him about getting his life right. He said, so I got back home. He's lived here in, in Fayetteville for about two years. And he said, I got back home, and he said, I thought, I'm going to check out a church. And so he Googled several churches in our area, and Washington Street came up. And he said, the very first time I walked in the door, you know there are going to be people who will walk through these doors that don't have a clue about the churches of Christ or Washington Street or any of you. And he said, I walked through that door. And he said, you know what I experienced? A warm welcome. He said, I couldn't get away from those people. (laughs) I love that. Uh, Don't you love that? And you know what? It wasn't just that. He came for six weeks straight. And and you know what he experienced? He started talking about some of you that sit in that back corner back there who just loved on him and encouraged him. Now, no doubt he gave his allegiance to Jesus and not to you and me. And, and, And no doubt he was covered by the blood of Jesus and not your blood or mine. It was by the resurrection of Jesus that the power was there for him to experience forgiveness. But I I want you to understand that what we do right here matters. And when someone across the street comes in here wanting to know about Jesus and wanting to get their life on track spiritually, you keep doing what you're doing. It does make a difference. It's powerful. I I can't tell you, I I didn't know him from Adam, and you didn't know him from Adam, but you loved on him, and you know what? I had the opportunity, like Philip, to just open the Bible and say, here's what the Bible says, and and he said, let me think about that. I need to process all of this, and then he came back. He said, I need my sins forgiven. Let's do this, 
How powerful is this? I want to tell you, it still works right here in the 21st century. But when we think about this story uh, where they both, uh, he confesses his belief in Jesus Christ like Don did this past week. He ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water and Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord uh, snatched Philip away and the eunuch uh, no longer saw him. He went on his way rejoicing. Uh, can, can I just share a couple of points with you about personal evangelism? When we go across the street, and let me say, if you're not comfortable doing it, if you make contact with someone who wants to open their Bibles, say something to me. We've got some deacons who will do it. We have our elders who will do it. We've got regular members who will do it. We want them, them to know about Jesus. And I get it, not everyone is cut out for a revival like there in the beginning of Acts 8. And even some people are a little bit apprehensive about opening their Bible and studying with a neighbor. But I, I will tell you, if you can find them, we'll study with them. But think about this, just a couple of questions. I mean, a couple of thoughts. Number one, what did Philip do that was so important? He asked questions. No, number one, he, he simply asked questions. Do you remember one of the questions he asked? Do you understand what you're reading? You know, there are people who will come in here and say, you know what, I, I really don't know. I, I just want to do what, the, what God wants me to do, and, and we're happy to help them in that way. But this very thought, do you understand what you're, what you're reading? And then wait and listen for a reply. A Bible study, study is not a place to argue about God and about your way and your thoughts. It, it's an opportunity to open up and share Jesus. That's what God wants us to do. I want to tell you there's no better thing than to open up the Word of God and talk about Jesus Christ. To share with others His saving message. Uh, do you know what the gospel is? If I were to ask you, and, 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 and let's say Peter comes back and he says, I'm going to let you in heaven, but you have to answer one question. You know, you know why? Peter's always there, right? He's, he's the gatekeeper. I'm being funny with that. Thank you for laughing, Mark. <laughs> you know, but in all these jokes we tell, these stories, you know, there's Peter up there and he says, I got one question for you. You can come on in and tell me what the gospel is. And how many of you would be able to share in a nutshell a simple thought about what the gospel is? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul talked about the gospel. Did he not? He talks about in verses 1 through 4, that it's the gospel that saves us. What is the gospel? What is it that saves us? And he goes on to communicate how Jesus died for our sins according to scriptures. And that the third day he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And that after he was resurrected, he is now at God's right hand. The gospel in a, in a nutshell is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now, now, just think, you're already, you're, you're ready to pass the test and get into heaven now this morning, right? You've got the answers. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what we share. When we ask questions, do you understand what, what, what you're reading? Do you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, and, and Philip started at that very scripture and he taught him the gospel. Number two, not only ask questions, use the Bible. Don't use anything else. Use the Bible. The scriptures help present Jesus. Uh, do you know that, that what, I, uh, what uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading was scripture? Do you know where Philip started to teach about Jesus was that very scripture? Do you know when in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about Jesus? He says it's according to the scriptures. You know, over and over, like in John, in 1 John especially, he talks about the Word and the importance of the Word. Use the Scriptures. God has given us His Word to help us. You realize there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we've got this one story, but in the Old Testament, over and over and over, it's, it's uh, prophesied that Jesus would come. And He did. Use those Old Testament Scriptures like Isaiah 53 to teach Jesus. Number three, help them to obey Jesus in baptism. You know, we're not given a lot of details about this story. How long was the ride? What were all the questions they talked about? 
How many thoughts were given about you know, what's going on at this point in the kingdom and, and what all's happening? We, we don't know all of the discussion. We have just a short snippet of this, of this story. But we know that Philip asked questions. We know that he used the scriptures to teach about Jesus. And also we know that he helped this man obey Jesus in baptism. I want you to think about that again. Baptism is so important. It wasn't only important with Philip. It was important with Jesus. You know, Jesus told them to go and baptize in Matthew 28, 18. It was important with Peter and with Paul. Peter talked about in 1 Peter 3, 21, about baptism also saves you. It's not the washing of the uh, filth from the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward Jesus Christ and through His resurrection. You might remember it's men like the Apostle Paul who talks about baptism. Or do you not know, Romans 6, that as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You've been buried with Him. You've been raised to walk in newness of life. Over and over and over, the consistency of this one thought, baptism, that puts us in contact with the saving blood of Jesus. Where are you this morning? Have you been, have you been baptized? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you grateful for the grace? Have you been immersed in Jesus to have your sins washed away? You know, that's what we're to do uh, to help people understand right across the street from this building, right here in this community, is to come in contact with Jesus Christ and His saving grace. If we can help you with that this morning, then we're going to ask you to step out into one of these aisles and walk forward. We'll ask you to confess Christ as your Savior. We will immerse you in the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away so you can be covered by His blood. There is salvation in no other. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing. blankets up here. We just keep handing them out every week. We've got so many babies. Um, No, it's a blessing and honor uh, to be able to share this time where we uh, recognize uh, uh, one of our own having a baby and being able to bring that baby to church and just with the promise of raising that child in uh, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so uh, the gentries are here today. And so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up. And uh, do y'all want to come up here or do you want me to come to you? Y'all come on up here. Yeah. Get these boys up here. They're excited, believe it or not. Don't look at their faces. They're really excited. How are you, man? All right. We've got baby Julia here today. And uh, on behalf of the elders and uh, on behalf of your church family, I want to present you all with this uh, baby blanket, fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're grateful to be able to pass that on to you all. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Coming from Jared, too. Think about that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. We're just grateful for this wonderful family. Let's bow. 
Father, we're so grateful for Jared and for Kayla and just their commitment to our spiritual family here at Washington Street, for their commitment to you and your way and to help these boys and, and now this beautiful girl to learn about uh, your son and to know about your kingdom. Uh, we're, we're thankful for their hearts and their commitment. We just ask that you would help us as their spiritual family to uh, encourage them, uh, to aid them, and to uh, help them along the way as they uh, raise uh, their family uh, to come to know you in your grace. Father, we're so thankful for them, and we ask all of these blessings and favors in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Yes. No other Good to see everyone this morning. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. We have a few announcements before we have our closing prayer. We have no one currently in the hospital. We do have a note from um, Kim, Jean, and Daphne, and, and Steve. They have a friend, Megan Walker Ashley, who is 14 weeks pregnant and unfortunately has found out that she has cancer. She's seeing a specialist on Monday after the doctor expressed some concern with the baby after her latest ultrasound. So let's keep Megan Ashley in our prayers, please. We do offer congratulations to Brett and Amy Ann Hurst on the birth of their daughter, Avery Lane Hurst. Born Sunday, January 29th, Avery Lane weighed 7 pounds, 13 ounces, and congratulations also to great-grandparents, Curtis and Ruth Ashby. Also very thankful to see Brother Parks, Brother uh, Skip Parks with us this morning. We're missing Brother Parks. We rejoice in the baptism of Don Berger. Don was baptized Thursday morning, February 2nd, and certainly wish him welcome to the Washington Street family. And as Brother Charles said, Andy Lyon is out of town today, so we ask that his class pick another class to go to this morning. Would you please stand for the closing prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice in your greatness and your power, in your gentleness and in your love. Please enable us by your spirit to honor you in our lives. We thank you, Father, for accepting us as your children in your kingdom. And we thank you for those who teach your word to others. We ask, Father, that you'll be with us throughout this week and provide the comfort of your Holy Spirit to those who grieve and to bring your healing, Father, to those who are sick. We're mindful, Father, of Megan Ashley, and we ask that you be with her and be with the doctors who are caring for her and give them great wisdom. We pray, Father, you continue to provide your forgiveness and your grace of your Son to all of us, all in accordance with your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.